Well, here it is early November in northern Minnesota, and we got a bunch of snow here, and we, we've got uh, a high today. It's supposed to be 18 degrees. It's getting down to about zero at night here. And uh, I want to talk a little bit about the timing of the whitetail rut and why that this weather has a lot to do with it. Interestingly, um, there was a Facebook group that I'm on where uh, kind of a new hunter came on there and he asked a question, a really simple question, what does weather have to do with the timing of the rut? And uh, of course there was uh, lots of different answers. The gist of it was people that pretty much understand that the rut is triggered by light. Most of them said, hey, weather has nothing to do with the rut. Well, I disagree with that, so I got on there and uh, put a couple paragraphs basically that the timing of the rut is primarily more about climate and uh, latitude than about weather, but weather does influence the rut, and I even believe that a full moon on a, on a bright, cloudless night can uh, affect the timing of the rut. So uh, I put this post on there, and of course, in true Facebook fashion, it took about 10 minutes before somebody got on there and was kind enough to inform me that I'm an idiot. And so I thought maybe I will take some time to really produce a video with some of the science about the rut and the timing of the rut and what causes the rut and uh, also some of my personal opinions from uh, 40 some years of bow hunting and observing whitetails. I just wanted to start this out right here outdoors in Minnesota because of the weather that we're having here and I want you to think about the fact that how the rut is really compressed here in the north and in, in northern Minnesota say Maine and in uh, Alberta, Saskatchewan, Manitoba and so forth and how the rut in the north is so much different than the rut in the south and just kind of have this information in the back of your mind as I go through these topics that I'm going to cover here. Uh, you know I deer hunted in Texas, South Texas in January and the rut was going full speed at that time down there. The rut can be mid-December to mid-January in Alabama and Georgia and so forth and um, I've been told, I haven't hunted Florida, but I've been told that in Florida Florida, the deer pretty much breed all winter. But in South Texas, for example, I saw the deer rutting in January, which means that the fawns would be born the end of July, basically. Here in Minnesota, if a fawn was born the end of July, it's going to be about 30 pounds in the first week in November here, and it's going to be covered with a very thin fur and spots, and what's its chances of survival? It's really, really slim if a fawn like that had to survive this weather. Pretty much not going to happen. It's not so much about when the deer breed, it's about when the fawns are born. That's why the rut takes place the way it does and the changes that take place into the deer's body are all about making sure the fawns are dropped at the right time. So the first thing we're going to talk about is the actual biology that takes place, the changes in the, in the brain of a deer that causes the breeding season. Back in the late 80s and early 90s, there were several universities that started doing a bunch of research on whitetails, trying to learn what made them tick. Now, we didn't have trail cameras at that time. We didn't have GPS, so there weren't tracking collars uh, that could be traced by GPS on deer and so forth. They did have telemetry collars, so, I mean, it's a pretty primitive compared to what we have nowadays, but uh, they did learn some things about deer. And some of these universities were really digging into what makes the white tail tick and publishing these studies that they were doing. And I, as an outdoor writer at that time, I was writing for the various deer hunting magazines and I was absolutely devouring these stories and cr creating stories from these studies. And about that time, in 1993, Tom Miranda called me up and asked me if I would work on a book with him. And what came out of that collaboration is this book, Corn.
corn fed giants that Tom and I did, uh, a step by step guide to locating and harvesting whitetails in farmland. And in this book, it was cutting edge stuff. I mean, it was we were breaking ground, and uh, because of all these studies that I'd been reading, and um, the, a lot of stuff that was published in this book about whitetails was brand new knowledge and hadn't ever been published in any book before, especially whitetails and how they relate to crops and farmland and so forth. Um, one of the things that I learned that I first published in this book was the way that the rut takes place and why the deer start breeding and it's very very interesting the 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 white tails have a gland in the kind of the center of their brain it's called the pineal gland and it's actually a photoreceptor it, it senses how much daylight there is and how much light in relation to a 24-hour period and and then it sends signals to release hormones hormones uh, based on the length of daylight hours and the, and the amount of daylight in a day. So as the days got shorter, then it would begin to release the hormones. The, the deer would rub the velvet off their antlers and as it continued to release more hormones, then the does would start to smell good and the bucks would start to like it. And uh, so the chase phase started and um, the rut took place. So that the pineal gland and the relation of the the amount of light that's entering their eyes and going to that gland is what determines when the rut's going to start. That seems simple enough, but it turns out it's a lot more complicated than that. And things like clear versus cloudy weather and even a full moon can affect that. So let's go into that a little bit more. And in the meantime, you might want to see what I looked like about 30 years ago. Well, good luck finding that book. It's been out of print for about 20 years. So we understand the science of what triggers the breeding period based on the amount of daylight in a 24 hour period. So from there, we can extrapolate and understand better why the rut is so much different in some areas than others. For example, the daylight changes a lot more in the north. The days are a lot longer in the summer, a lot shorter in the winter than they are in the south. So that lengthens the amount of time that the rut can take place and the intensity of the rut because it's so compressed in the northern part of North America where the whitetail breeding period is just chaos for about two weeks in November. So think about the perfect time for a fawn to be born for maximum survival rates. Here in the upper Midwest, you're looking at May, basically the second half of May. The danger of heavy snows are gone and uh, you got a complete green up and you got nice weather. It's a great time for a fawn to be born. In Texas, Alabama, Louisiana, Georgia, you can have fawns that are born in July and still will be able to make it through the next winter. They don't need the bulky body size that would they need to get through the winter like they do in the north. The snow that we got on the ground here right now, it's going to be here till April. So if you want to know where the peak of the rut's going to be in your area, just look at when the fawns are born. Backdate 200 days, roughly, which is the gestation period, and you got the peak of your rut in your area. Okay, that's the science of it. Now let's talk a little bit about the speculation here. And this is where I want to hear your opinions on this because these are just my opinions, okay? So assuming that the rut is triggered by the length of daylight hours and the amount of light that's coming into the whitetail's eye and being transmitted into the pineal gland, which then produces the hormones, what if you have a string of bright, sunny days leading up to the rut where you don't have much cloudy weather, and as you know, on a bright, sunny day, it, the days are longer, there's more light at both ends of the day. If it's cloudy, heavy overcast days, you got quite a bit of less light uh, at the ends of the days. And for example, think about how much more shooting light you have on a sunny day than you do on a heavy overcast day. Could those trigger a difference in the rut? Okay, could 
a series of cloudy overcast days actually bring on the rut more quickly and I believe that yes and that's when I say that weather can affect a rut that's what I mean by that how about this how about if the full moon leads up to the first few days of the rut and you got a bright full moon clear skies you got more light going into the eyes could that actually delay the rut a little bit so there's a lot of factors that can affect a rut by a few days you might see more breeding activity taking place sooner if the weather conditions are right for it and I'm talking about pretty much extreme conditions I'm not talking about two cloudy overcast days I'm talking about a string of maybe eight days out of ten or something like that which isn't terribly uncommon here in the northern Midwest so those are my thoughts on this and sorry this got a little bit long but I, I want to hear your opinion on this am I crazy please don't call me an idiot like the one guy did but uh, drop a comment below thanks for being a part of this channel I mean I, I, I love diving into this interesting stuff with you and I got more videos coming so we'll talk to you next week